Hey, all right, there we go. I just need to make sure that we were <laughs> we were live. There we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Info Dump. Uh, today we have uh, Ren Guerrero. Did mm -hmm. I pronounce that correctly? Yes, you did. With a fantastic backdrop, who is here to info dump about getting a PhD in sleep? What uh, what prompted you to uh, to go ahead and ooh master's program? That's a lot. <laughs> so I actually skipped my master's. I went straight from bachelor's to PhD, which was interesting. But I had a lot of unsolved questions. I had a lot of things that I was still interested in from a purely basic science approach. And like my bachelor's wasn't enough. It wasn't enough specialized information for me. So mm -hmm. I did my bachelor's in just sort of like general biology um, with an emphasis on like molecular biology and genetics. But I'm like, this is not what I want to do. I don't want to poke around in cells and try to measure tiny molecules. I want to know like the answers to big questions. Yeah. Like the one question we do have is why do we sleep? Science doesn't really know this. Really? Yeah. Even after all this time? We've really only been studying sleep for about 120 years. Okay. Since EEGs came along. And even before that, people have been thinking about sleep for thousands of years. Sleep yeah. and dreams. And it's always been an interesting topic that humanity has been like obsessed with. Yeah. But we still don't know why. <laughs> and it bugs me so much yeah oh that's I, and and that's how that's how uh progress moves forward is you get somebody that's why does that you know why why do we do this who then decides to make it a a, a life's journey to figure that out uh i have a lot of gratitude for anybody that that chooses to do that because that's that's big work <laughs> a lot of a lot of hours a yeah. lot of hours working on it yeah yeah. What would you say is the most profound thing that you learned during your course of study? The most profound thing I've learned? Ooh. Um, I've learned a lot about myself throughout the study, which isn't necessarily helping our understanding of science, but it made me realize that like, I am just a small individual person. I can't answer these large questions on my, by myself. Mm -hmm. And so this is what really got me into teaching. I am a teaching professor and like teach classes to my students and have them in my lab and impacting them and trying to get them to answer these questions. Maybe I can inspire them to answer my big questions but answer their own questions. That's what I've learned is I like that getting other people and advancing where they want to go. Yeah. Helping them out in a way that I can. Yeah. Um, having, having a conversation with somebody and watching as that, Oh my God, I never thought of that before mm -hmm. kind of goes off in their head. It's man, it's a privilege to bear witness to. It's so good. It's or the when best. they are confused and then they finally get something and you're yes. like, yes. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. 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 It is literally the best. <laughs> uh, when, when did you first, I guess, get curious about why we sleep? So this started, um, I haven't been a great sleeper throughout my life. So as a child, I was a, a sleepwalker and I would go to sleep in my bed and I would never know sort of where I'd wake up. And so I'd often be in the hallway or downstairs on the sofa. Weird. So that sort of got me noticing it. It drew its attention to myself. Yeah. And then as a teenager, I learned how to lucid dream. That was a mm. skill that I was like, wait a minute, I can control my dreams and you can teach yourself how to do this. How and old so were you when that happened? I'm really curious. It would have been when I was a sophomore. And so that would have been 20, I was 16, 16, man, you, you wouldn't believe how many people I talk to who have these transcendent life-changing, uh, I guess, revelations or understandings at 15 or 16 that then causes them to direct the course of their life towards something big. That's and really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I've met several people who like they found their they found their love or their passion um, for the thing that they've strived for all them all their life at 15 or 16. I praise them for like 
pursuing it and keep going with it, even though it's like a little teenage idea. Yeah. And we get crazy teenage ideas. And so forgetting <laughs> one that like you actually stick to. I yeah. Think yeah. Oh, man. Uh, what did your journey look like to it? So I always think of it in like where my schooling has taken me because school has got me to where I go. I'm still in college in the academic fields. And so I figured it out high school years. That's when I started lucid dreaming, when I started training myself and sort of get my attention to it. Um, and that was due to Mr. Rich's psychology class where he had us keep a dream journal and then we had to do dream interpretations, which Very is an outrageous work. science. Yeah. But it has a lot of like mystical, personal and like metaphorical benefits, I think. But he was teaching it from a scientific perspective. So it was just a little. Yeah. It was so, interesting. Well, I mean, it, even in a metaphysical sense, you're still you still need to gather data. Mm hmm which is a very scientific process. It's uh, you, you, in order to become better at something, you have to kind of track your progress so you can see how far you've come. So that makes sense. And it's just all data. And I love data. <laughs> it's so good. Oh man. Uh, and so after high school, I went to college. That was like the thing that my parents sort of coerced me off to do. My elder sibling did the same thing. And so I was like, all right, I guess that's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> And I thought I was going to be a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. I was pre-med in biology. And so I was like, high stress, high anxiety. Got to get all the grades. Got to study for the MCAT. Would stay up all night studying for stuff. Yeah. And yeah. that was not good for me. Mm. It was not good for my psychology. It wasn't good for like my interpersonal like reactions and interpersonal relationships. It was bad. And so I had to pivot from there and be like all right you can't do med school yeah seems like a terrible idea mostly because a lot of patients don't listen to their doctors because mm -hmm. a lot of doctors don't take the time to understand their patients and so it's a weird like we are going to pay yeah. you on this tiny interaction and there's really like the whole medical system is set up for these interactions to fail Oh yeah. And, that, and they're all mechanical. It's you, you treat every single patient exactly the same. There's no trying to meet the patient where they are the way that you do in therapy. You know, it just, it's a broken model. It's, it really is. And I'm really worried about it. We see this a lot with like people with chronic disorders. I got a couple of those. I live with the people who got a couple of those. Yeah. It's just how the medical field has really just disappointed us. Yeah, really I really sort of changed the trajectory of our lives. Oh, yeah. I, I think about I think about all of my disabled friends who have all of these additional barriers mm -hmm. to surviving, much less thriving in this kind of economy, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I really hope that we're coming closer to having a larger conversation about that. I hope so. Yeah. Um, it runs on um like people as a way to make funds and to way like make money yeah and it works i guess for that but it doesn't work for the patients yeah it's not a human thing it's a money thing it works economically but uh economically you also get hey in order to do things you got to break a few eggs uh, and we're talking about killing people just so we're clear yeah. right you know and there are so many people who fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know people with sleep apnea. I know people that, you know, they they have problems sleeping with the CPAP machine or the, their partner has issues with the sound of the, the CPAP. Um, and that really, like, depends on your age or, or uh, how heavily taxed your lungs are, depending mm -hmm. on your health, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, it's about like your sensory thresholds. Like, can you deal with like a big piece of silicone squished against your face right? for 12 hours? And a lot of people are like, yeah, I could do it. But then subconsciously, as soon as they fall asleep, they're like, it's off. Or it, it's, it's, it's all nasal and they're like, oh. mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and just, just bypasses everything. Yeah. So not a lot of hope in the medical field. Yeah, unfortunately, and so I was like, all so. right, what else can I do? 
And so I ended up, um, after conversations with some friends of mine in marching band, um, I learned that we had a psychology professor that did research in sleep. And this was a brand new, like, sleep, you can make a profession about this. People study this full time. Yeah. This was my first realization of that. And that's what, that's what started. As soon as I figured that out and was in that lab for two years, I was like, this is what I want to do. I'm so glad you had that opportunity. Uh, I really wish that um, society and schools actually put forth, okay, that that narrow window of these couple of, of things that are going to make you a shit ton of money. Mm-hmm. That's all that gets taught as opposed to like, you know, I mean, you know, studying zoonotic viruses or, you know, biological, um, biological system collapse. There's just a, a whole bunch of things that that exist in this world that we kind of forget about because we we get distracted by man-made things like TV and and books. Not that books aren't fantastic, but I mean, a, a lot of it is distraction from things because our lives are shitty. That's <laughs> all we do. All we do is we we wake up, we wash our face, we go to work and we draw a paycheck and we bring it home and it's either enough and we still worry about money or it's not enough and we worry about feeding ourselves or our kids or losing our house you know jesus there are so many people who are suffering and if 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 it was made clear at a a younger age that there were actually trajectories of learning that human beings can engage in that would be satisfying Mm -hmm. and would serve humanity dude i don't understand why that's not where we're at with education now (laughs) Education now is a uh, interesting. It's thing. grim. <laughs> it's it is on the verge of collapsing. It is yeah. not helping the students. Yeah, it is a broken, restrictive, very expensive system. Very much so, and and public education isn't helpful because it's not teaching anything except for obedience and compliance Mm -hmm. you know i mean you have to know the rules so that you can color within the lines and if you color outside of the lines like you know oh i can't even tell you how many times when when i was a teenager how people would oh if your hair were just you know it's natural color you'd be so much prettier you know don't you want to wear a dress i mean you're such a pretty girl you'd look so much better in a dress it it flashbacks to my yeah, childhood. Right? Yeah. And that's and that's I always I always call that the system moving to protect itself. The system is trying people that are so inured to the system, if if you want to think of it in matrix terms, that they're they're bound to protect it. And the way they protect it is by policing everybody who doesn't mm-hmm. toe the line. And that's why that's why trans issues make people crazy. That's why LB, LGBTQIA two spirit issues make people crazy because it doesn't stay it doesn't sit well within that pigeonholing aspect that literally everything Mm -hmm. within society is designed for and i think for some people recognizing and staying with the binary is easy and they don't want to do the hard work to think about oh there's somebody else who's beyond this experience or between this experience or not following to these rules and that upsets me a lot because like even with my cis friends I always challenge them to at least think about where their gender came from and where this identity came from and all the ones that I'm really close to have gone through the whole gender journey and they figured out sort of okay this is what I don't like about my gender rules and roles this is what I do like and they're getting there they're getting better I think people are getting a little more open about the possibility that authenticity fucking rocks. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, how does this, how does this, um, Oh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to, to ask. Um, would you say that sleep has an influence on how we see ourselves? 
<laughs> Absolutely. And so even beyond the mind, so we're going to think of the mind of the brain. The mind is intangible and it's really like we can't measure what happens in the mind. And so all of my data and all of my expertise and all of my time has been stuck in the brain mm -hmm. and how the brain functions. But even just by studying that and skipping out on the mind, I'm skipping like 50% of how the brain functions. Yeah. And so that's like a little asterisk to all of these things that I say here. All right. You're going to have to remind me of the question. I completely forgot the question. <laughs> it's okay. I'm right there with you. Um, it, it does the way that we sleep um, affect the way we see ourselves. And I'm going to go ahead and do this because my camera is being weird. Come on, man. A little foggy. So this is exactly what can happen when you don't have enough sleep. Your eyes have trouble focusing. Ah. Just like this. And so everything that your brain controls is can be and will be affected by lack of sleep. Okay. And so all of the, the most of the knowledge that we have about sleep is what happens when you get inefficient sleep. And so this is a well-studied field. We've studied this um, from neurological, let's measure little molecules floating around in the brain, from psychological and how people interact with information, their emotions, et cetera. All of these processes get impacted by yeah. sleep deprivation. And so like you'll have trouble concentrating trouble paying attention you'll mm. have trouble handling stress because your stress response gets impacted if you can't handle your stress that will kill you that yeah, will court, make court is you... a bitch <laughs> it really is <laughs> Oof. it really is your brain won't have enough energy it won't have enough like sugars and ions going to it for those cells to function as they should yeah. and so that will impact everything from getting up and like getting yourself nourishment to trying to enjoy your hobbies. If you can't pay attention to them, if you can't pay attention or like focus on the task at hand, yeah, that's going to impact everything. Yeah. And sleep yeah. does that. Yeah. What is the best way to go about trying to get a good night's sleep? For, for me, uh, I have fibro. Mm -hmm. And I have restless leg syndrome mm -hmm. that my my legs likes to like to dance when I'm trying to sleep. And I'm like, dude, come on. <laughs> like we're trying to go to bed here. <laughs> yeah. So the biggest thing is consistency and setting up patterns that you do every day. And so from uh we call this sleep hygiene. These are the things that you do when you're getting ready to go to bed and when you're in bed. Mm -hmm. And you always want to make sure that every night, this is work days, non-work days, whatever your schedule is, this is consistent. And so like the time you go to bed, the time you wake up, if you do it consistently, your body keeps track of that. It has a clock and the clock will be like, alrighty, I'm used to waking up at, so for me, I wake up at seven. And so I'm used to waking up at seven. You go to bed at 1030. It's the same every day. And that helps your body anticipate what I need to do to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. It anticipates what it needs to do to wake up and it allows your hormones to work better. It allows your brain to work better. It allows your metabolism to work better. All of your internal systems are impacted by that. Um, and so timing is very important. Consistency of environment, I think would be good too. So make sure your sleeping area is very comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. Make it as free from distractions as you can. Um, so I only sleep in my bed, well, sleep in other activities, but I never study in my bed. I never spend large amounts of time in my bed um, other than sleeping, because then it's like your brain recognizes that this location is a good place for me to sleep. I am as secure as I can be. I'm as comfy as I can be in the moment. So that helps. Um, our house okay. is noisy. And so I have earphones. If you need a eye mask, whatever it is to block out other distractions. Okay. Okay. Let's see. So environment, timing, light is bad for you, especially blue light that will keep you awake. And so we really recommend you don't get blue light exposure at least an hour before you go to bed. Interesting. And so no, means, no screen time, no led screens, phones, okay. computers, tablets, even televisions that can all make you harder to fall asleep 
your sleep is going to be crappy and it's going to be harder to wake up. Well, damn it. There goes watching YouTube videos before I go to bed. <laughs> but you can do non-visual <laughs> entertainment. So I listen to a lot of um, books and music. So okay. it keeps my brain occupied because my brain is anxious and keeps running and thinks all the time. So yeah. I can keep it busy with my book, but then I don't get any extra light. Okay. Yeah. I've, uh, I've taken to, I have so many books I need to read. <laughs> so, so I either have paperbacks or I have them on uh, the audible or whatever. And uh, so I listen for about an hour and I figure, you know, in an hour, I'll probably be able to get to the end of an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I fall asleep and then I can back up, but it's a nice way to go to sleep kind of learning. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like it. They have sleep timers and all the devices. And like, if you don't have an audible subscription, most libraries have access to free audiobooks. Oh and yeah. You just need a library card and you yep. can get audiobooks with no purchase price. Yeah. 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 And I forget, I, I think Libby is one of the apps. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one that'll let you kind of log in and check the audiobooks at your local library. Exactly. And so they're, hopefully easily accessible for everybody and so i i do like that especially if you're stuck with like if you're a phone scroller i was a phone scroller and i was saying things <laughs> all night and be like and, and your phone is heavy and you're doing this and it's just like oh i'm killing myself slowly <laughs> like slowly <laughs> and that blue light is telling your brain to stay awake oh wow that's what it comes down to mm. um and so it stops our body from making melatonin, which is sort of our, um, pr it promotes deep sleep, that good restorative sleep that we need. And so you tell your body, we don't need that. We don't need the sleep hormone right now. We don't need melatonin right now. So yeah. that's directly what the blue light's doing to you. I have a question. Somebody had once mentioned, um, I guess an input break where you try to, uh not do anything visual anything i mean just basically uh, it, it sounds like meditation but yeah. just being quiet just sitting quietly somewhere and just kind of taking in the world and and i guess following the track that your monkey mind goes on because mm -hmm. holy crap but I, i'm wondering what the benefit of that is so you say meditation and meditation was the topic of my dissertation research. So I am very right. interested in this and know a lot about the, not the mind part, but I know a lot about the brain part. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically meditation neurologically is like a lighter version of sleep. It's like a baby version of sleep. Okay. And so when we sleep, no, first, so when we're awake, our neurons are firing, they're very active, they're firing at different times. And that allows you to bring in sensory information, think about things, do motor outputs. That's what allows you to do all those sorts of things. Yeah. When you go to sleep, those neurons get nice and slow and rather firing at different times, they start to fire together. Okay. And by the time you get to like actual deep sleep, um, which would be non-REM three, if any of us know the stages of sleep, hmm. um, it allows you to get sort of this restorative action that is, seems to be good for your brain if you stop this deep restorative non-REM3 sleep you don't get the good benefits of a good night's sleep mm. what meditation does is it slows your brain down and it starts to get the neurons coordinated similar to what takes place during sleep and so okay. it does the same sort of thing neurologically Okay. So that's why if meditation, if sleep is good for you, if I can get a little light version of sleep with your meditation, that's also good for your brain. And you can feel real refreshed. You can feel energetic after meditation. Um, my focus is so much better after I started meditating. Um, it is a valuable thing to help train your brain to either hush up the quiet and intrusive thoughts or yeah. to allow you to pay attention to your own internal thoughts. So you can sort of focus it however you want to, but it all is good. It all does the same thing neurologically. Yeah. I remember uh, reading a book where the author had had posited that um, we all have an internal narrator 
you know, like, oh, I'm picking up the water. Oh, I'm drinking the water. I'm like, motherfucker, could you shut up? Like, I already know. I don't need to be on a TV show, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he had basically said to try to just pull away from that, to not need the narration so much, because I guess our heads get so cluttered with all the information that we take in, especially nowadays. Um, I would imagine in the 1800s or the early, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s or further back, you still had some basic distractions, but it's never been a hundred percent of your uh, focus and attention for hours a day. You know, even with with menial labor jobs, your mind could wander. But with with things like watching TV or reading a book or engaging entertainment, you kind of have to it, it pulls all of your focus. It does. And I'm wondering how much of that is unhealthy. I don't know if we know yet. We do know that this like multiple pulls of attention tends to train people's brains to not be good at paying attention to a specific one thing. Mm -hmm. And so it make it harder when you want to do something and you want to do a task, it mm -hmm. makes it harder for you to pay attention to that. So mm -hmm. we do know that. We also know when you have multiple different types of sensory input and a lot of the social interactions that we get from social media that also stresses people out. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> Especially the news. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. all of that stress and being in tune with what's going on everywhere in the world immediately as it happens can constantly keep your brain in like this, I'm really stressed out. I'm not safe. This isn't a good place for me to be. Yeah. And all of that stress is again going to keep you awake, which is going to make you more stressed which is then just the cycle continues. Yeah. Yeah. Um I'm we got we got about 30 years. Uh I, I remember creating my first web page mm -hmm. in 1994 when I guess the internet kind of went live. I was mm -hmm. uh I was working for this fantastic company in Herndon called Intercon and we made the only TCP/IP suite software for Apple machines. And, you know, so I, I was kind of at uh, the forefront of the Internet with with uh, a bunch of other people. Um, and, you know, we experienced the first uh, junk mail and the first <laughs> spam mail and, mm -hmm. you know, and so I'm I'm wondering exactly when medical science decided, hey, since. The way that we intake information is changing to an alarming degree. Maybe somebody should study this effect on the human being. And I'm wondering if if anybody jumped into that. Not that I know of. That doesn't mean it's not out there. That just means like my specialty is not within there. I've never gotcha. asked that question. I've never thought about that. Yeah, I'm really curious to, to find out if. Yeah, because it would be really interesting. To, I mean, I. There, there have been human reactions to every major upgrade in communication. You know, you've got uh, the radio, you've got Morse code or the telegraph, you've got the phone and every single upgrade, TV, every single upgrade was heralded as the end of humanity <laughs> by large sections of the population. Mm -hmm. And here we are still, you know. 30 years into this experiment called the internet where I never thought I'd be able to have a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody over this medium mm -hmm. until, I don't know, a thousand years from now. And now we, we have things that I couldn't even imagine back when I was playing Pong at Pizza Hut because that was the only game in town, yeah. <laughs> right? I hope that there's I hope that there's a, a group that is uh, it, it, that is interested enough to to jump into that question mm -hmm. and find out how I mean, you've got you've got studies that, you know, are apocryphal. Oh, my God, this person killed themselves because they did too much of the interneting. But that really sounds too much like I smoked one weed and then I robbed a <laughs> liquor store. Right. You yeah. know. 
so I'd be really interested to to see if there are any any scientific or medical organizations that are that are studying those effects. So the one organization that could potentially study this, mm -hmm. that I think like this would fall under their purview, um, the National Institute of Health, the NIH, yeah. they are the largest funder and they take all of our like tax money and they put it out to biomedical research. And they have an initiative called the Brain Initiative where there are funding projects to specifically learn more about the brain and more about how they function. And I would challenge them if they don't already have like a, a grant solicitation or they fund people that are interested in this project. If they don't already have that out, I think they should do that. I well, somebody should get on it. Yeah. <laughs> right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. See, now I'm wondering if anybody is is who is watching knows somebody in the field of biology or medicine or uh, science or like other uh, another scientific field mm -hmm. where that kind of work is being done. I would imagine you'd have to do it at, at various levels, mm -hmm. you know? I would love to hear if they know of people because I'd yeah. love to look at their research because. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are the things can you think of that pertain to sleep that a lot of people don't consider? Hmm. I don't, a lot of people think sleep, a lot of the, the barriers that I've had to deal with. So I teach, I teach a sleep and circadian class mm -hmm. and I have the students do a sleep experiment on themselves as sort of like a interacting with their own sleep and critically thinking about what they're doing what they're controlling, what isn't controlled and how they could potentially make it better. Yeah. And a lot of them don't realize of the other things that they are doing, that sleep is not just like a suck of time. It's not like a, oh, I could be studying, but no, I need to sleep for eight hours. Yeah. They would rather with go sleep, forego sleep and fill it with something else, whether oh, yeah. that's socializing, studying, whatever is important to them in that moment. Yeah. And then they don't realize when they feel bad, even not the next day, but even like multiple days afterwards, yeah. they don't realize that's just because of that one bad night's of sleep. Yeah. And so I hate wow. seeing sleep as like a, it's like a secondary importance to individuals that it's like, oh, it's okay. I can sleep later. I want people to put more importance into helping their sleep because yeah. it will help everything about you. It'll help your thinking. It helps your stress tolerance. It helps your immune system. People that don't have sleep, they're mm. going to get viruses and colds more quickly. Yeah. It's going to impact your immune system. It's going to put more stress on your heart. And it's going to cause um, cardiovascular disease or um, high blood pressure, heart, fast heart rate, all of that. Yeah. Um, it can impact your GI system, your gastrointestinal system. And so like I had, um, it has since resolved, but I did have IBS mm -hmm. for multiple years when I'm on a, when I was on a specific medication, um, I was taking testosterone for about a year on my gender transition exploration history mm -hmm. and it caused some IBS symptoms mm -hmm. and they got better when I got my sleep better. Interesting. It was weird. And so I don't know how much of that is me putting my own bias that, oh, sleep is going to save and help my health at all. Yeah. I got to be yeah. aware of that. But it's definitely better. It's definitely good. That's outstanding. I just, I there, I think there are so many things that we don't take into account with our bodies mm -hmm. that, you know, it, <laughs> dehydration comes with a whole bunch of fun symptoms. <laughs> and and I think I think I think I would not be being hyperbolic if I said at least 75 percent of the population is dehydrated, if not worse, especially with all these fucking energy drinks. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if anybody's doing a study on what pumping all of this caffeine and sugar into kids. What are their hearts going to look like when they're 30, when they're 40? Are they just going to explode? You know, are they going to make it to mm -hmm. 50? Are they going to make it to 60? Um, and it just so much about the way that we we intake our food has changed in a hundred years. 
you know, uh, it, it's I, we went from the Great Depression where there was no food to a literal I'm going to call it a sickness of riches because there are entire industries that are dependent on people being shitty with their health because of what the food that they're they're mm-hmm. pumping out all of this processed stuff all of these uh you know additional additives um and it at some point we stopped realizing that vegetables were good when did vegetables get demonized you know i remember that in my childhood yeah like i Mm -hmm. yeah so i'm wondering exactly when people started going well it's almost like there there's a weird straight man mythos of vegetables are gay uh, you know, and mm-hmm. it, it it it's fascinating to watch the I only eat meat people. I'm like, so enjoy losing sections of your bowel when you get older. <laughs> you know, um, it. I think we take. I take bad or I have taken bad care of myself in the past and. I noticed that that people who have been in abusive relationships um, who are codependent um, tend to think about the needs of others before we think about our own. And so sometimes there's a, kind of a disconnect that, oh, shit, my body needs sleep. I need to eat. I should drink more water. You know, um, I would imagine that that eating the rainbow as my nutritionist put it and sleeping i i'm really wondering if if you had somebody that was on point with those things and who had also done the really hard heavy painful work of addressing their own trauma how many medical issues would go away without needing medication and i think it would if you address it early enough it would prevent a lot of issues And so you mentioned early, you have fibromyalgia and that is literally a disease of too much stress has wrecked your nervous system. Oh, wow. And that's literally like what causes it. And so if your body is scrambling for nutrients, if it is trying so hard to get rid of these extra things that are in there, especially with processed stuff, we're not hundred percent sure what's in them. Yeah. Um, and then if you don't get enough sleep and you can't digest it and process it and get it out of your system well enough, yeah, of course that's going to cause diseases. Of course that's going to cause problem in these poor people. Yeah. And if you're stressed about your health, then we add mm. more stress back to the cycle and it keeps, it keeps coming back. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it's, it really does seem like a, a, a never ending small animal wheel. Oh no. <laughs> right. Yes. You know, I and, and the same thing happens with with uh, the cycle of poverty. You know, you one thing goes wrong and then you're fucked because then your car blows up or, you know, one of your appliances goes bad or you're going to put your food. You know, there's a whole there's a whole collection of systems that we depend on in order to keep our food fresh and in order to keep ourselves safe. And. If we don't have that, if we find ourselves homeless or on the street, you know, how are you going to get a good night's sleep unless you have other people like soldiers that are doing homeless fire watch or or I will rephrase to houseless people, unhoused people fire watch. Um, I, I can't even imagine how stressful that would be. And I, I know several people who who have lived uh, without a home for a while and it just sounds nightmarish Mm -hmm. i just i don't understand why in a world where there are people who have enough money that they could never hope to spend in a lifetime they they can't give back to society so that we have good educational systems and helpful medical facilities and no fucking insurance Mm -hmm. you know because i think for them it's more about a consumption like i need more there's always going to be a more need for bigger numbers on my bill like like bigger numbers on my bank account yeah more stocks more property they want more constantly 
it's economic and, dick measuring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's less of like, all righty, I'm happy and safe and secure. But what's going on with people around me? What are the people next door doing or the people in the next town over doing? Yeah. And again, different societies are going to place their worth on what the common good is going to be. Yeah. Like, are you going to pick up your trash because it's better for just everybody? Are, are you going to pick up your to... dog poop? Oh, come on. <laughs> We just saw some today on our walk. And, oh my God. Joked about it for like, way too long. What kind of an asshole are you who just wants to like walk their dog and leave shit everywhere? That's, you should not have a pet. That's not, you know. That's... Having animals is a privilege. It really and it's is. it's work. Yeah. And you got to take care of them. And And our pets, our companions deserve better from us. Yeah, for sure. What else? What else do you think everybody should know about sleep that has not already been mentioned? So I already mentioned we don't know what sleep does. The yeah. closest we've gotten to it and the most sort of biological theory that we have is I think we should update everybody on what like the science is doing and what the science is showing. And yeah. so there's a paper that came out in uh, 2013. So what is that? 11 years ago. So relatively recent. Mm -hmm. And this was in uh, Macon's Nettergaard's lab. And it's the first author's name is G. And they were looking at what happens to the fluid in our brain while we're sleeping. Yeah, And so if you're not aware already, we have like, like our blood flows through the entire body within mm -hmm. our brain, we filter out that blood and we make a very specific fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. Mm -hmm. It's in your brain. It's in your spinal cord. It gets all your cells, their nutrients. It takes all of their wastes away. It is the main like transport mechanism for your brain cells. Mm -hmm. And what they found in this 2013 paper is that this fluid is able to get in between the tissues and get in between your neurons and clean them better to clean out their waste, to clean out their um, previous things that they have made with, to clean out free radicals that could potentially damage your cells, to clean out old stress hormone or other hormone signals that are in your brain. And they're able to clear it out when you're asleep and then you can go out and you can excrete it and get it out of your body. Oh, wow. And so when you don't sleep, you're not allowing this fluid to clear out your tissues. You're literally not allowing the waste to get removed from your system. And so, so this is why the neurons can't communicate as well. So how fucked am I that every Thursday for far too many years, I would go to a club and then stay until two in the morning and then maybe get two hours of sleep and then go to work the next day. <laughs> so I was with you staying up till two, not a terrible thing. The two hours of sleep though, that is concerning. That is yeah. not good. It yeah. takes multiple days for your body to try to recover that. And mm -hmm. so even if you, the recommended, the data shows for your best functioning of your brain, and they looked at like 2,000 subjects all across the United States. And they found at 7.3 hours, that's when your brain functions the best. That's mm. when you're able to remember the best. That's when you're able to have your attention the best. So okay. I always shoot for seven and a half hours. So that way, seven hours, 30 minutes, it takes you 10 minutes to fall asleep. You're good to go. And so anything less than that, you are building up sleep debt. You are building up and your brain keeps track of how many proportionally they don't it doesn't keep a track of hours but it keeps track of how much sleep it has lost mm. and that you need to get rid of that sleep debt or your brain is really not going to function well your brain's not going to be able to do what you need it to do and so it does keep track and so okay. really my next question would be when you went out on Thursday night what would you do Friday night? What was oh, your sleep like? I would pass out probably early. Mm -hmm. uh, well, all right. Friday night. 
So when I was a teenager, I would go to Rocky Horror Picture Show every Friday and Saturday and probably not sleep. And then I mm -hmm. would like sleep the entire Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, to try to make up for it. Is there is there a way you can get too much sleep? There is. Um, so I'm glad you're able to pay off that sleep debt eventually. Teenagers are better at that. <laughs> Kids are better at that. As yeah. we get older, it's harder for our systems to do. It's harder for your 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 brain to actually do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it does keep track. What was the other part? Oh, um, too much sleep. What is too much sleep? Too much. What are the effects of too much sleep? So too much sleep. I've had a student, I've had a couple students ask me about this before. And so I have delved into what other people have researched mm -hmm. and no one really is able to get people into their lab to sleep for longer than they normally would. And so okay. the only data that we have is people that are already having too much sleep. And what we mm. see with these people is the too much sleep is most likely a symptom of something else that is going on. Mm. And so um, long sleep has been associated with like major depressive disorder, generalized mm. anxiety disorder, PTSD. And it seems to be more of like a warning sign of maybe there's another psychological or neurological imbalance that your brain is trying to compensate for by having you asleep. So maybe like an additional uh, healing or recovery thing, sleeping longer. It's okay. trying. Yes. Yeah. Cause I know that um, I, I, I think people with long COVID or, um, Oh, I can't remember the, the, the condition where you're just exhausted all the time and maybe you're awake for an hour or two a day and the rest of the time you're sleeping because you, you, your body is unable to function normally. Um, is that narcolepsy where you fall asleep all the time? No, no, no. Something this is, different. this is a condition where you, you're just, you're just exhausted and there's, there doesn't seem to be anything that can be done to mm -hmm. allay that exhaustion. Um, so that would just oh, be chronic. Just... Hang on. We got, we got, uh, one true cripple, a friend of mine mentioning chronic insomnia for over 20 years. I've noticed ta it taking a bigger and bigger toll. Mm -hmm. yeah it's going to yeah and so you're not getting enough sleep and so it's your body's keeping count it's keeping track of all that sleep debt and that's why it's unfortunately impacting the rest of your body now um in in cases of extreme stress mm -hmm. where your monkey mind won't shut up yes. and it's difficult to get to sleep unless you utilize uh alcohol or substances mm -hmm. to try to knock yourself the fuck out or, you know, even melatonin, sleeping pills, stuff like that. Um, is there, is there a healthy way to try to knock yourself out so you can get seven hours? So alcohol, THC and cannabis and um, what are the other ones? Like a Benadryl, any of those sort of medications. They're going to put you to sleep faster, Yeah, but they are not going to make your sleep really better. You're going to have poor quality sleep. You're not going to be able to get the deep restorative sleep. You're not going to be able to clear out all of that waste product in your brain with your cerebral spinal fluid. And so it would like, yeah, it gets you to sleep, but what's the point if you're getting poor quality sleep, you can mm. still wake up and you can still feel super tired. You still have all that waste in your brain okay okay so the biggest thing for home remedies so you can do melatonin mm -hmm. the problem with melatonin is once you start taking it your body gets used to you getting it from an external source yeah. and so you will stop making your own internal melatonin and that's fine if you want to just take melatonin for the rest of your life or if you just want to take it for a month and try it out and then be clear of it for a while to just help you with like a little bout of insomnia or a little bout of chronic stress that's going on. It can be valuable. Okay. There are not a lot of good medications out there that get you more sleep and higher quality sleep. And so there mm -hmm. have been drugs that they have tested. There's lots of sleep causing agents. We call them somnogens, mm -hmm. things that cause somnolence or cause sleep. Yeah. Um, 
there are somnogens out there, but none of them mimic the good qualities of sleep. They are not a replacement for natural sleep that your body is naturally keeping score of. Okay. And so with those, it's, you just have to go back to the consistency mm -hmm. and then maybe get it. If you're able to get a sleep study done, if you're able to have somebody look at what's wrong with your sleep, maybe yeah. you have a sleep disorder that you didn't think of. So I have sleep apnea and sleep bruxism where you grind your teeth and it causes like jaw pain. Yeah. yeah. Um, once I got those treated, I didn't need to take my melatonin all the time. I didn't mm. need to, I was a cannabis user. I was an alcohol user to use it to help me go to sleep. Yeah. Um, especially in college. Oh my goodness. <laughs> if I, once I got my sleep apnea taken care of, now I don't have to rely on those as much. Mm. So you really have to treat it like, yes, this is another disease. This is another disorder. This is another thing that I need to take care of, or it's yeah. going to impact your health. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any advice for someone who is in a high trauma situation for um, trying to get to a point where you can get to sleep? Is it uh, more of a, a meditative thing? So meditation is a good one. Um, meditation would be literally any practice that your attention is on something or on everything around you. So it's a focused control of attention. Mm -hmm. And what meditation can do is it not only gets your brain used to firing like sleep, gets it used to um, functioning like sleep, but it also reduces your stress. Yeah. And so that can be a way that you can actively trick your, well, not, not trick your body, but you can actively tell your body it's time for us to not be in a time of stress. You can stop making that much cortisol. You don't need to breathe this quickly. Your heart rate doesn't need to be this fast. And it tells your body to slow down. Yeah. And that can then help you to then be able to try to get sleep. But okay. meditation is hard, especially oh, yeah. if you meditation. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found in my research, I wanted to look at people that have never meditated before. Mm -hmm. and what we found with these novices is that even five minutes of meditation on our one attention test, it still helped. And so even yeah. if you're only able to do five minutes, that is still something that you're actively doing to benefit yourself, to benefit your brain, and hopefully benefit your sleep. And so it's worth trying because I think we can all find five minutes for ourselves to help our brain. Yeah. I'm wondering if also um, like turning everything off and just sitting with the quiet for a while would have kind of the same effect where you just kind of, all right, we're going to just be organic and mm -hmm. we're not going to do anything electric other than, you know, brain signals and neurons firing. Yeah. <laughs> and so I like to do um, when you shut off everything, I like to focus on my breathing so mm -hmm. my monkey brain has something to focus on to mm -hmm. keeps me in the moment. And I just count my breaths and I count up to 10 and then back down to one. And that's a cycle. And then do that over and over again. And so okay. that's a easy so is it breathe in, count to 10 and then breathe out counting to one. You breathe in at whatever speed you want. Okay. I recommend to always try to get it a little slower. Yeah. Because the slower your breath, the slower your heart's going to be, the more restful your body will be. Yeah. Um. And so if you can get nice, slow, deep breaths where you feel like you're getting all of your lungs, including those way bitty bottoms of the lungs, mm -hmm. if you're able to fill all of those up and then release all of that, that would be one count. Okay. And then the next time you have a breath and then breathe out is two. Okay. Slow okay. breaths. Yeah. And that's the type of meditation we did in our novices. And even just five minutes of that, will help you. Maybe okay. you want to focus on a mantra or a prayer. Maybe you want to focus on the flickering of a candlelight. Maybe you want to focus on your emotional roller coaster that's going in through your brain. Yeah. You can do that. Just make sure it's not stressing you out more. Yeah. If you need to focus on something, that's okay. Okay. I like to focus on incense lines as they flow around. I oh, always find those shapes meditative. Great. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. I'm trying. To, I had another question, 
Let me see if I can find it in my <laughs> file drawer. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Oh, and I forgot it. It's it was really good too. That's okay. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. So, um the 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 like these kind of ring apps like the aura ring and the mm -hmm. thing like that that monitor your heart rate and while you're sleeping and all that is is medical science able to collect data from that and kind of incorporate it into a low level sleep study so if you can measure your heart rate if you can measure your breathing or your general movement patterns, you can figure out what your sleep patterns are. Okay. And so those are three common techniques. Um, any of the Fitbits, the Apple Watches. Um, I've seen like the Nuvi ring where it measures your, your heart rate through there. Yeah. Your heart does a specific like slow down and patterning that is very different from awake and very different from sleep. Yeah. And so I know there's a lot of consumer products focused on getting this health information and it could help you with your sleep. And yeah. a lot of those apps are really good at actually determining what your sleep patterns are yeah. or how yeah. much deep sleep versus light sleep you got, or how long did it take you to fall asleep? That yeah. is all valuable information that they can figure out. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of physicians know what to do with that data though. They're mm. not often trained in this. Unless you are a neurologist and you usually have to be a neurologist that has been trained in sleep medicine, which not all of them are. That's it, not their focus. It just seems to me that at least for people who can afford the high end health mm -hmm. stuff um, that it, it I would hope that somebody's uh, compiling it and and trying to kind of learn from it. Um, it, it. It seems it seems a shame to have a tool where a medical uh, a medical system can monitor your vitals and then hey by the way you might be having a heart attack or hey maybe you should put that bacon or that pork sandwich down you know i mean mm -hmm. it it and well i mean it remains to be seen as to whether people will listen because <laughs> people are people yeah. and you know we we kind of do what we want mm -hmm. <laughs> um but I, I, I would like to think of a world where that information isn't being weaponized to uh, create a marketing campaign mm -hmm. so that some rich asshole becomes an even bigger rich asshole. It, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that some of this technology is being used for the benefit of humanity as, as opposed to the benefit of somebody's pocketbook mm -hmm. or bank account. I hope so, too. I don't know if it's true, though. Yeah. I'm a bit of a cynic and I'm just like, I don't. Yeah, if I hear have that. It, but like, maybe if we work within that system, they can use it to sell us more sleep things. And so maybe that would incentivize them to collect, record and invest with looking at the sleep data. Yeah. Maybe. But yeah. that feels weird to say. I didn't like saying that. Well, uh, considering how monetized everything is right now mm -hmm. and uh, a, an upgrade for anything is you're going to buy the thing again, pretty much, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's so if you get a ring, you know, they're they they're always coming out with new products. They're always coming out with new phones. They're always coming out with new appliances. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, I don't know how many uh, rare uh, metal or earth components are used in these things you know how many how many child laborers are used in the mines to gain the, those materials and so it 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 becomes a you know how much how big is my footprint how big is my impact um and is it is it worth it to get the information i need to stay healthy and i guess that's another conversation that humanity is going to have to start having at some point that's a big conversation yeah. It's like, it comes down to you, you need to take some agency in taking care of yourself Yeah. or you can't help the rest of the world. Yeah. And a oh, lot yeah. of people self-sacrifice to help others, but you also need to take care of yourself. And so I would recommend everyone that's here is to do a little bit of research on like, if they have sleep data, Yeah. who has it? Um, where can you access it? Yeah. 
Do you understand what this data is? Mm -hmm. And maybe use it to help learn more about your own personal sleep habits and you can make them better. Yeah. Yeah, we have a question. Out there. We have a question from SJCUK13. Does it matter how you're laying when you do slow breathing other than being comfortable? So slow breathing during meditation, no. It really comes down to comfort and the way that it's going to impact your heart is relatively similar if you were laying on your back, if you're laying on your side, if you're laying on your tummy, it's all going to be similar ways. So if you are able to do it, you're able to breathe fully well, you feel like your airway isn't obstructed, like I don't lay on my stomach anymore because I feel like I'm getting suffocated by my neck folds here. And so I would opt, I opt for other sleeping positions. And so as long as you can breathe well, and as long as you're comfortable, that's the most important part because you don't want to be stressed out that you're not getting full breaths. You don't want to get stressed out that you are like your hip is hurting or you're feeling that walk from this morning or any of those aches and pains. And so again, whatever's comfortable this is best for for people with um uh sleep apnea or who who consider they might have sleep apnea it's that whole yes where it sounds like they're dying and you're just kind of waiting it is their airway closing it gets so relaxed and then it up (laughs) and then your brain's like oh shit i can't breathe and then it wakes you up so it can open up again yeah i can't imagine that that is a, a healthy sleeping experience is there a way to try to address it until you're able to get to a doctor to address it there absolutely is um there have been some studies that they look at um like exercises that you can do yourself at home and it's a lot of like weird mouth movements and a lot of like and like looking up to the side and doing some breathing and it's a lot of that where you can strengthen these muscles and if these are stronger with just like your 15 minutes of home exercise a day they'll prevent your airway from closing up now is it is it oh sorry i I hope that wasn't too loud i knocked my mic is is the airway closing up like like this or is it kind of collapsing if you're lying back or on the side or something like that it depends on like where it depends really on your neck anatomy for like me I got like extra neck fat I got the chin here and it will sort of like close up on the top yeah and it doesn't necessarily squeeze like a tube it more gets like flattened I see okay yeah. or okay. the other is there a way to is kind if- of like sleep is there a, a position that is uh I guess best to keep the airway open the side would probably be the best. Okay. I'm yeah. Because when you're so. on your back, your whole weight of your neck is pushing back right on that breathing tube. Yeah. And so if you can avoid that and allow it to like weight to go off to the side, yeah. that way it's less pressure on your air tube. And so I've seen yeah. people do silly things, even of like taking a, a headband with a ping pong ball and putting it on the back of their head. And Uh so if they were sleeping on the back, the ball would like dig into the back of their head and it would train them to, oh no, I need to be on my side. What an interesting idea. Yep. I've seen these at like um, the neuroscience conferences that they're trying different interventions to train you to incentivize you to not sleep on your back. I imagine you could get the same the same thing if you uh, like tied a a bandana and had the knot in the back. So it kind of dig in. All right. All right. So those friends of mine who who have sleep apnea, uh, if you if you decide to try that, please let us know. <laughs> mm-hmm. And look yeah. up um, sleep apnea exercises and like strengthen your jaw, strengthen your throat, and that will help a lot. OK. Is there anything else that you can think of that you you want to impart? That I want to impart. Um sleep is important. Don't neglect it. And however you can get more sleep, I would recommend it. Um, My journey was I was interested in dreams and dreams got me into better sleep. And that worked out awesome for me. I love dreams. I love trying to find meaning and like self-improvement in them and self-insight in them. 
And I think they're a valuable thing to pay attention to as well as your sleep patterns and if you're getting sleep or not in general. Yeah. Yeah, that seems like a good place to end it. Okay. Unless you have anything else you want to talk about. Sleep is good. Please do it. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank everybody who who decided to comment. Um, it's... This has been a very informative conversation. Thank you so much for uh, for being on the podcast. You're welcome so much. I, I very much enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. And you can find me. Um, I'm a professor at George Mason. And so my email's up. And so if you want to ever talk, send me an email and we can talk about stuff okay. casually and over email as well. Okay. Uh, send me your contact info and I'll go ahead and put oh, it yeah. in the, the YouTube link. And that way people can reach out to you if they need to. Okay. Thank you so much, Ren. You're welcome I hope you have so a, much. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs> Take care.